Miami moved into the 1980s with style as its global popularity exploded. But popularity had its price when, 90 miles off the coast of Florida, Cuban dictator Fidel Castro unleashed a wave of immigrants to America from a Cuban port called Mariel. Uh, the Mariel boat lift occurred between April and the fall of 1980. 125,000 Cuban refugees in the port of Mariel came to Miami. Many of them, uh, in regard to the Orange Bowl, received assistance in the way of food, clothing, medical help, and shelter. The Orange Bowl became a temporary haven for a lot of refugees as the city, state, and federal governments struggled to deal with the massive influx. One of the things we did at Miami-Dade, uh, we ran classes in the, in the bleachers in the Orange Bowl on how to live in America. Miami survived the massive migration and life continued to move forward as it always has. Facing the challenges of a diverse population, the stadium grew in its variety of events. With the sport of boxing attracting a growing audience in South Florida, local promoters were drawn to the size and excitement always associated with the Orange Bowl. It was 1982, I believe. Then they really had it, right? Then they had the fight of the year. And that was Arguello, the gentleman Arguello, who was just a wonderful, wonderful guy and a magnificent fighter, fighting Aaron Pryor. Aaron Pryor was like a little barrel of dynamite waiting to go off. He was explosive. It was a great fight. It was exciting. Of course, here, the Latin population, we were all for Arguello, uh, was hysterical. And they add such a dimension of excitement, of feverishness to, to the fight. that you couldn't sit still, it was like seeing the Ali Fraser fight. And the, the electricity rises and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. By the end of the fight, you're standing on your chair screaming and hollering. It was a tough, tough fight. Which prior one? Well, it was really a, a beautiful, beautiful place to have a fight. The Orange Bowl's been a venue also for several concerts, big time acts. You've had uh, Police and Sting here, Michael Jackson, Bruce Springsteen, uh, the Rolling Stones, and by request, a lot of these artists wanted the Orange Bowl. They loved this venue, and generally what happened was your best seats would be the field, stage would be up in the east end zone, and the place just rocked. Uh, the stands would be fairly filled also with people. So it was a great venue, again, because of, I think, the sounds and the way they carry in this Orange Bowl, it was a perfect venue for large rock concerts. Rain or shine, the Miami faithful always came to share in the music and the excitement. Eventually, though, as ticket prices climbed over time, the concerts migrated to more modern indoor facilities. Regardless of the movements of people or rock and roll, the stadium always returned to what it did best, football, Miami style. For years, the University of Miami football program languished while the Dolphins team visited so many successes. Taking a chapter from the pros, the university hired the Dolphins offensive coordinator, Howard Schnellenberger, to the head coaching position of the Hurricanes football team in hopes of having some of that success rub off. I was coaching with the Dolphins under Don Shula back in those days, and uh, I had just gotten back from Baltimore where I was unsuccessful as a head coach under Bob Ursay. And uh, this was going to be my job for life. Uh, Don Shula was not going anywhere, and I was his uh, top offensive assistant, and the pay was good, and I was living out in Miami Lakes, and uh, uh, I was just in a great situation. The University of Miami gave me a call. I was at home by myself on a Saturday afternoon and offered me the job. And without even thinking about it, uh, I said, no, I'm not interested in, in coming down to the University of Miami. You've had six coaches and, se and seven athletic directors in the last 10 years. Uh, it's a graveyard for coaches. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any chance for, for uh, uh, improvement. Uh, and so I had forgotten about it. Uh, about uh, three hours later, my wife comes back from the hairdresser and I tell her about this terrible call I had from the University of Miami. And she quickly reminded me that I would probably never get a head job in the NFL after I had so curtly told my owner to go back up in the press box when he told me to change quarterbacks in the middle of the field in front of my football team. So reluctantly, uh, I took the job. The University of Miami's Hurricanes were feeling Coach Schnellenberger's power on the program. His pro-style passing attack saw the team steadily climb up the charts. In 1984, 
the Hurricanes found themselves at the precipice of history with the ultimate bowl game on Orange Bowl soil. This was the 50th anniversary of the Orange Bowl Classic. Nebraska was the number one team in America and the Hurricanes were 11 and half point underdogs against the mighty Cornhuskers. But Schnellenberger and the passing power of Bernie Kosar delivered the Hurricanes to a 31-30 lead in the fourth quarter. Nebraska's coach Tom Osborne decided to go for the win instead of a tie. But the magic of the Orange Bowl and the determination of Miami were against him and his team. The gamble didn't pay off and the Hurricanes won. The amazing victory over Nebraska brought the university its first national title. It was during the latter, ga latter games of the Orange Bowl, the 50th anniversary in which the University of Miami played in, that was played in that venue. So that 90% of the time the home team won. And that coupled with the dimensions, the uh, aesthetics and all those things made it the hardest place in America for a team to come in and win. The Hurricanes were winning one, one national title after another. We were in football glory here for about 20 years. And great teams, great ball players. While the Hurricanes enjoyed their newfound success, the Miami Dolphins were ready to leave for their new digs further north. The Orange Bowl, the home where the famous Dolphin Dynasty years became reality, bids farewell as the team makes Joe Robbie Stadium home in the 1987 season. During the mid-1980s, uh, the, the Dolphins and, and my dad were very interested in, in seeing major improvements done to the Orange Bowl facility uh, or in seeing a new stadium built to replace the Orange Bowl. And, uh, the, the powers that be in the city of Miami, led by Maurice Ferre, were really not interested in, in uh, doing anything major to improve the facility, and they certainly weren't interested in building a stadium. And uh, yet there was a lot of sentiment in the community uh, for, for helping uh, out, as other communities have done, to build a facility. Uh, and uh, I remember there was a, one of those Sunday morning uh, local TV shows uh, that had kind of a debate format and uh, Maurice Ferre and my dad were, were on uh, TV and uh, uh, talking about the, uh, the stadium issue and Ferre at one point said, uh, well if Joe Robbie uh, wants to build a stadium, I'll let him go do it himself. And he said it in such a way that it was obvious to anyone watching it that he didn't think it was possible uh, for that to happen. It was, he was blowing him off, basically. And my dad very calmly looked at Frey and said, that's not a bad idea. I think I will do that. I mean, he, he bought a football team. He didn't have any money. He ended up owning the Dolphins. And uh, he didn't ha have any money. He ended up building a stadium without any public funding. And the guy was just a genius. He went out and solicited uh, people to buy suites that weren't there yet. And they gave him some advance money so that he could then borrow more money to get enough to, you know, put down on, to begin uh, construction of a stadium. And ended up building that stadium. It was a remarkable accomplishment, and uh, I think he should be given credit for it. I mean, he, I don't think to this day has ever been given the credit he deserves for what he did here for football in South Miami. <laughs> 